future, talk radio will actually educate, inspire, and make you think. <laughs> the future is now. Topics and music that affect your life from Universal Broadcasting Network. Tune in at ubnradio.com. Greetings and salutations, everyone. You have once again tuned in to Dr. Juti WTF here in the heart of Hollywood at the UBN Radio Network, Universal Broadcasting Network. And we have a very international show today. We are going to have a beautiful lady and mom of three from Dananda in Australia. So we probably won't be able to take any call-ins today, but later we will be shrinking our normal tune relative to things. And you can pull us on Stitcher and iTunes and, of course, see this later on YouTube. So without any further ado, Judy, did you want, you want me to do the introduction? Um, <laughs> sure, go ahead. And then we're going to be chatting a, a lot. Yeah, we so have a great conversation. Speaking as much. No, as, um, it's okay. I, I, I'm, you know, two beautiful ladies. I'll bow out. It's okay. Yeah. <laughs> so we have Maha Al Musa, and she has had an organization forever since 1997, and has been called the Mindful Movement to Awaken Birth Wisdom. And she's going to enlighten us as to. Um, all what that's about, and uh, she's an international speaker. Uh, are you an author yet? Yes. Yeah, international <laughs> author, as I figured, and she's been, of course, on radio, TV, all over the world. So without any further ado, you're it, we're here. So I want to welcome you on yeah, the welcome, show. Welcome. We have been Facebook friends for a while now, and I know that you have been a, a, a huge proponent of breastfeeding, and I've always been interested in your work. And I thought, well, why don't you come on the show? Because we're all about attachment theory, and uh, we're, we're, we're centered on the mother-infant connection. Because when there is not a mother-infant connection, then people develop all kinds of psychopathology, and they end up in my office and they're suffering from depression depression and anxiety and then they uh, also uh, fill the hole in the soul as I got I call it with uh, drug sex and rock and roll is typical mm -hmm. and, and all kinds of defense mechanisms and the key to preventing all of that is good mothering good parenting and from what little research I did this actually is as you can well imagine the basis and foundation of attachment theory and there's a lot for us to talk about I, I'm just curious if you're familiar with attachment theory I am uh, familiar I am familiar I'm actually a product of the baby that was taken from her mother so I've embodied it <laughs> wow okay I'd love to hear the history behind that if that's okay with you sure good place to okay. start yeah okay well shall I start yeah, Fire please. Away. Go yeah, ahead. yeah. Um, I was taken from my mum as a six-month-old baby by mm -hmm. my father in 1962-63 mm -hmm. and I was brought to Australia when I was two and I didn't know my mum until I turned 33 when I found her. Wow. So until the age of seven, I was at boarding school at four. I had oh, different wow. nannies and nurses looking wow. after me and yeah. my brother as well. Mm -hmm. So I had this huge gap from six months of age to seven years of age when my dad remarried. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. and then when I was 28, I found my mum in Lebanon, in Beirut. Wow. And up until that point, I always felt the disconnection from the motherland, the mother tongue, the homeland within myself. I'm actually Palestinian Lebanese. So, you know, there's a bit of political history there as well. But being separate from my mother, I always felt there was something missing in me. Yes, of course. And yes. and, and uh, it's very interesting what you chose to do about it because yeah. you really, really chose to repair this in the next generation. And I know that you've received a lot of flack for what you do. And as I promised you, I'm not hanging <laughs> you out to no, dry. not our style. Uh, I really congratulate you for being a role model to mothers who uh, breastfeed and, and need role models of mothers who do breastfeed breastfeed and, and as well as uh, your birthing practices because as as you know and I want the audience to know as well that uh, the 
the experience of an infant starts in the womb. I call it womb service. And if things go well in the womb, then that is, is the first environment. And then when things go transition well from the womb to, um, to the environment, things are off to a good start. And I think that you've paid such particular attention to building um, ways that women can really be ac accommodate themselves and their babies to welcoming their babies into the world in very gentle, loving way. So of course I want to hear about that. I, I want to start with the attachment and the breastfeeding and what is necessary for a healthy human psyche, which unfortunately you didn't get, right? You didn't get your mother at six, uh, from six months on. And that is a very key time for a baby to have a mother. Yes, exactly. And I've always carried within me as I grew up that detachment, that, um, you know, longing for being deeply loved and yes. that being missing. Yes. So I, I, without knowing it and without realizing it, I unconsciously, before I became pregnant, was searching for that. I've always mm -hmm. been a searcher of truth. Mm -hmm. And I realize in many ways it was the search for love, for deep connection and love. As you know, we are mammals and we right. all need to have a sense of belonging, that that sense. And the mother being the source for me was what I was always searching for, which was the, the center of love, regardless, unconditional love. Uncond no unconditional love. That's what we talk about a lot love. on this show. Yeah. And you couldn't say it more plainly. I mean, it's it's so true. Everybody is actually looking for unconditional Everybody. love. Everybody. Absolutely. And, and I was going to say unconditional love is an action. So you can't just say, I unconditionally love you. What does that mean to an infant? That means, as you know, consistency, eye contact, skin contact, breastfeeding, attunement, uh, general uh, infant-centered parenting. Because a lot of parents uh, parent according to their own needs. And we can't parent according to our, our own needs. We have to parent according to our children's needs. That's and so right. that is the foundational of a healthy human psyche. So um, go ahead. I, I want to know yeah, more about how you. Say, yeah, when when um, we have children, when we have babies, and I can only speak from a mother's perspective, from my own perspective, that's when the healing starts in mm -hmm. many ways. And mm -hmm. going back to our own infancy and going back to the place where my needs were not met Right. is a place where unconsciously I will start with my child, my first child, whether I realize it or not, is looking for that unconditional connection between mother and baby to heal those wounds that are deeply longing within myself. And so we, when we, we don't realize often that we are raising our children in a way to heal our own wounds. Mm -hmm. But when we have the awareness that that is what's going on, then we can open up to a 360 degree view of what does mothering and parenting feel and look like. When I realize that I am at the center with my baby, mm -hmm. healing those unresolved holdings that are within myself, yes. surrender. And what I realized too, Judy, was that for me, it was about not being able to be vulnerable. So what that did for me was to build up protection, layers of protection, mm -hmm. which were places where I was fearful, but mm -hmm. I put up barriers to vulnerability because beyond vulnerability is trusting. And I realized my whole adult life in all my relationships, I didn't trust because I couldn't be vulnerable. Well, of course you couldn't trust because the first stage of development is trust versus mistrust. And trust is built on the relationship between the mother and the infant and the protection of the mother of the infant. Just out of curiosity, was your father nurturing? No. He was and not. Was, no. Do I you, had no, a difficult upbringing with my father. You so did. that added that extra layer. Okay, because... Um, what mitigates the damages oftentimes when the mother is not able to nurture is a nurturing father. But if there is no nurturing mother and no nurturing father there, then um, I, I call that space, I, I named it the double dungeon. Okay, mm. the double dungeon of darkness where you turn within and you feel empty because there hasn't been that uh, flow a breast milk, that flow of unconditional love, and then you turn without 
uh, to the, your father, and he's not there either. And then checkmate, you're in this double dungeon of darkness. And what you chose to do about it is to be a beacon of light and heal yourself through this connection, and very intuitively so, because it could have gotten gone the other way. That's right. right. And I've had people say that to me when they've heard about my upbringing. They mm-hmm. said you you went you could have gone the other way with a needle in your arm. Right. Basically. Most many exactly. do go the other way. That's right. And That's what right. we talk about is uh, in terms of double dungeon, just to expand that really quick, is the relationship you did or didn't have with your mother is a rela- is in uh, relation to your inner world. And your outer world is a reflection of the relationship you didn't didn't have with your dad. And if you don't have one with your dad or your mom, then you're in what we call a double dungeon. That's right, which is the, the center of fear, deep-seated yes. fear. And it's what, what do we do with that fear as a child? What, where do I take that? Do I shine a light upon that and seek further to understand? Mm-hmm. Or do I go even deeper into the underworld with that fear? So well, uh, I chose the light. And, and by, by choosing the light, as you said, you chose to heal yourself. Now, many mothers who come from that kind of background, and I see them in my, um, of my office, um, will exhibit extreme abandonment issues, borderline personality disorder, cutting themselves as symptoms, uh, going into deep, dark holes of depression, and then uh, revisiting these patterns on the next generation because I see a lot of multi-generational damage. So uh, for, for the people who are listening, who are mothers, who are parents, understand the significance of attachment theory because really when you look at it from a, um, a, a, a a healthy brain perspective, psychoneurobiology, what what a mother is doing by contacting that infant and nourishing that infant is soothing the amygdala, which is the part of the brain that is the emotional brain. And when that amygdala calms down, then cognitive development can take place. And so that the emotional brain, which uh, is now soothed, can 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 make room for cognitive development because if the emotional brain is always firing and always in fight flight abandonment trauma then we can't think straight and then people uh will complain that they have add or adhd or inability to um perform well in school and studies actually show that babies who are breastfed have higher cognitive uh, um, abilities than babies who are not. Along with better immune system, there's just so much that goes into it. Can you elaborate a little? Because I'm sure you've studied this as well. Well, it is. And I I suppose for me as well, um, even talking about my father, I'm just tracking back a little bit. My father was a home birth. And in the village where he came from in Palestine, my grandmother his mother had nine home births wow. so all of her babies were breastfed for two years okay. and that was just a normal and natural thing that was done at the time mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. a lot of what the that I've I guess operated on a deeper level is from an intuitive heartfelt understanding and I followed that as I say the mystical codes of the feminine reside within every woman's womb mm-hmm. how we access and activate that is also dependent on the culture or the environment around us and whether it supports or negates that. And that's what I do in my work and in my talking about breastfeeding to natural term or whatever works for the mother and the baby and the family. So I keep bringing women back to that intuitive place rather than, you know, um, because we have a lot of facts and figures. We have a lot of the, you know, understanding of why breastfeeding is good and what it does for the mother. And I keep coming back to women, do what works for you. Come back to your heart space and feel into that. The mother and baby being the expert. That dance is where I like to um inspire women to go to my father was a very leading internist here in southern california and he had a phrase he says the maternal instinct in women is very very strong and he was saying that not only from a personal perspective as a father but obviously as a very professional perspective as well absolutely well absolutely and that that's where my work emanates from and it's a funny thing because i didn't have the mother yet 
somewhere within me, spirit guided me to stay strong in that maternal instinct. And perhaps because I didn't have it, somewhere in me, I wanted to experience it fully. And, and that loss awakened that instinct in yes. you. How interesting. I call these yes. things cursed by designs. I've had yes. many in my life. And um, sometimes these traumas that hurt us so deeply are the very traumas that awaken I- right. in a human being this level of awareness. And you, you seem like a very open hearted woman and oftentimes what happens is that people who experience this kind of trauma close down and they get very defended Mm -hmm. and shielded and as you said you did go through that phase of the layers and the layers um so what what uh what was it that inspired you or or gave you the courage to just start dropping some of those layers and become this beautiful open um, spiritual, nurturing, stand for, for womanhood. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Well, <laughs> I guess my births, I mean, we can go now to, to birth because for me that's the arena that I, I'm, I work in of the last 18 years and I've had three natural births. So I've had three births without any intervention, without any drugs, mm-hmm. and I've had them in this beautiful place that I live in, Byron Bay, which is very, very strong feminine place, mm-hmm. and it's actually an Aboriginal women's birthing place. Oh, wow. So the essence of this place carries the voice of the feminine. Yes. So my work, yeah, and my awareness was seeded in this beautiful environment So I have to be very grateful for the environment that I'm in. Mm -hmm. And that is what I wanted to speak about. The environment that we cultivate for a pregnant woman and for her baby is so significant in that rite of passage journey that she walks along. So, And having, I I don't Mm -hmm. mean to interrupt you, but I just want to talk about the environment. Here in America, we don't always have that environment because we sometimes we have two uh, income families. Women are uh, pressured to go back to work when their infants are only three months, six months old or even sooner. And so they miss out on the opportunity. Other countries, for example, Sweden gets 80% of the income for 16 months. Yeah. yeah, to have a child, and we don't get anything. Right. So speaking of support system, yeah. there's very little support system, and I I just don't think that women families know enough about attachment theory. John Bowlby, I want to credit him because he did a lot of work back in the 1940s uh, with babies and secure attachment and anxious attached attachment and dissociative attachment and different attachment styles and depending on how we attach early in life is the blueprint for how we um how we are in the world except that the, except that there are some exceptions like yourself you didn't blueprint off of your mother mm-hmm. well you, the, from the birth i don't know really about my birth but yes. i i knew that i had to you know, heal through myself through my own natural births and which that is what has happened. And I, because I work in the birthing world and it's, it's my love and my passion, a few things. I mean, that hour after birth is so significant for our neurological printing and wiring Mm -hmm. of what love looks and feels like as you, as you have spoken about. And if we miss that because the brain is firing, the circuitry of the brain is looking for the attachment to the mother, that connection which is that state of love. Mm-hmm. And unfortunately, and I've said this before, I would have to say probably 90% of mothers and babies on the planet birthing today miss that opportunity in that hour after birth that is so, so significant. Mm-hmm. And my work is about creating environments for the mother to birth where the feminine rite of passage of birthing, the foundations of that, are understood, revered and respected. And what does that mean? How does that look in the world? If we cultivated those kind of environments where babies were born into the arms of love, how different might the world look? And that's the area that I'm very passionate about. Well, first of all, I would probably not have very many patients at all if that were the case. And Mm -hmm. I, I, I... Clearly, from the work that I've done and and, uh, having sat in that chair as a psychologist for 
geez, over 25 years, I can clearly say that the, uh, the, the most preventable cause of psychopathology is mother-infant connection and father-infant connection and the, uh, the supportive environment. And father is the number one um, obvious supportive environment. So I also find that when when father is not in the picture, when father isn't there to nurture the mother, because this is a system, it's a trickle-down system. So I wanted to know more about um, the people in your life, the fathers of these children, or the father of these children. What Was the father there for you? Was the father there for the children? So did you feel nourished by the male energy? Mixture of that, because Mixture. I think I chose in relationships father's very similar to my father not a typical a, that's man. very common right yeah very common right and so and that also stems back to my inability i don't take i don't blame or point the finger at the fathers in any way shape or form because i understand it's what i chose having right. been anxious attaching in relationship looking for love yes giving away my power yes all of that sort of thing yeah Yes. But they were there, beautiful fathers, and they were at the births of each one of the children. I've got two different fathers mm -hmm. to my three children, mm -hmm. and they were there, yes. And so it makes a huge difference when the father nourishes mother because when mother's not nourished, then mother becomes anxious and mother then um, passes that anxiety yeah, to the child. can't nourish the child. And so if the father is not available, it's so essential to be in a community. And it sounds like you've built this community of supportive, loving women. So if the father is not present, then grandmother, grandfather, aunt, uncle, women, kinship, friendship. This is so, so, you know, takes a village, doesn't it, to no, raise a child? Yes. And that's, again, coming back to where I've raised my children and where I've birthed in Byron Bay. We have that circle of sisterhood. It's very, very, very strong here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so my work was seeded in this place that really supported the feminine expression, the mother what is what is needed for birthing this was the land of home birth here most children you know 15 12 15 years ago were born at home in this area mm -hmm. was very common so you very chose that area uh, by by chance or did you chose it by choice in terms of the, the this choice area? yeah choice i knew of this area and chance and choice mm -hmm. <laughs> but I, by choice definitely and i've stayed here by choice and my daughter was born at home i was 46 years of age mm -hmm. so i had a home water birth with her which is a very unusual in the world out there yes it is the baby. and it yeah. makes all the sense in the world from both a woman's perspective and, and a, a baby's perspective because water is what the baby <laughs> is in right yep. and water is oce oceanic in quality and so we've got this environment within and so the transition is so beautiful when a, a mother gets the support of the water and I remember giving birth and it wasn't a water birth and everything hurt and I didn't have this buoyancy to support my back and to support my body so I can only imagine what that mm -hmm. must feel like for a woman and then the baby to be born into this beautiful warm water and of course the umbilical cord is still throbbing so they still get the oxygen it's not like the baby is going to drown i want mothers to understand the baby's not going to drown correct correct <laughs> so the cord is still pulsing the oxygen the blood supply the stem cells is still coming through okay and then the baby is just very gently the mother can reach down or i reach down gently lifting the baby onto the chest which mm -hmm. is your natural thermometer so mm -hmm. they keep the baby close the ability to smell the baby, the baby's eyes are wide open with the adrenaline, with the pushing stage, looking for mother. Yes. So the baby and the mother are wired to find one another in that first hour, especially well, after birth. And then you right. put them on your chest and then therefore the child can hear your heartbeat as well. And the heartbeat, which they, which they did, right. of course, when they were, were in sight. Exactly. And that, yeah. this is what, if you are left to your instincts and the environment supports that, a mother will naturally... In most cases, and the baby will follow through those steps without anybody telling her to do anything or, or interfering or, you know, saying what must be done or not be done. The mother and the baby will 
go through those stages naturally. Well, along those lines, I found this one little fra- uh, section here I wanted to kind of elaborate, which said a few minutes ago, by holding your child safe in your arms and giving nourishment from your body, you offer them a sense of continually from pre to post birth life. Gazing into your eyes, your baby comes to understand that he or she is loved and protected and that you are there to provide for their needs as he and she adjusts to this new world. Beautiful. Absolutely mm-hmm. beautiful world. And that's it. That's it. That's the adjustment from womb to world. Mm-hmm. And I have a saying that I say, imagine this for a moment, that the mother and the baby are the experts. That's right. And know what they're doing. Well, there's a, there's a, it goes a little deeper. It says your newborn uh, doing this also, is the physical, physical closeness, is because they're thrust from a close, dark womb into this overwhelming experience of bright lights, loud noises, new smells. Your baby needs the reinsurance uh, of your continued physical presence. So, Walt, I, you know, I just wanted to comment how how we don't offer in, in America. Typically, I watched the birth of my grandson, and that was not what was happening at all. And I, I, I was quite shocked because I did talk to the doctor beforehand, and what we discussed was not what happened. The baby <laughs> was removed quickly from the mother and placed in a tray, and the lights and so on. And I... I said to the doctor, can't we just wait a little bit? And can't we just wait till the umbilical pulses a little bit? And cut, 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 remove, tray, lights, none of this. I mean, you could, you could talk to the doctor all you want, and he's going to agree with you. But at the end of the day, he's going to do what the heck he wants. So, so yeah, I know. And it's really disturbing. Yeah, and so yeah. it's, it's, what what they, I, it's what they do. Judy, mm-hmm. as well, is I talk about the feminine voice in birth. So I say, why are we trimming, modifying, cutting and severing the voice of the feminine in birth and at the same time out come the scalpels, out come the instruments to cut the mother and the baby out? What is this about morphing her experience into something to make other people comfortable without regard for her and the baby? Okay, so from my psychological perspective, if I'm going to shrink that, then it just seems like we are a society of disconnected people. So we're projecting this onto the woman. And instead of honoring the instincts and honoring nature, which we've come so far away from, we almost we almost don't even know what it looks like, but we do. We do. As women, we do. Even as men, we do know what that looks like. We do know what that feels like. We have to trust that little voice in us that says, no, 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 no. Don't cut that umbilical cord. No, no, no. I remember when I had right. my, yeah. my, my second son, um, the nurse came to take him to the nursery, and I had a big fight with her. I said, no, you're not taking my child. You're, my, my son is going to sleep with me in this, uh, in this bed. And finally she gave up, and I was finally, and it takes courage for a woman, it and that's does. right, to fight and say, no, yes. you're not going to do that. Well, and, and we shouldn't be fighting. No. We right. are this beautiful right, spiritual rite of passage, this of opening into the heart space. And here we have women having to fight for their rights to speak up. And this is what I also talk about, Judy, is that you cannot take a feminine rite of passage that requires all these things we're talking about, intuition, instinct, patience, mm-hmm. timelessness, mm-hmm. flow, rhythm, mm-hmm. And then place it in a masculine paradigm called a hospital where there is hierarchy and there is somebody at the top and it flows down through the system and then expect her to open and be relaxed. So How does that work? It doesn't. Make that, it, make doesn't. it doesn't. However, no, it doesn't. what would you say to women who are concerned? And, and I think on some level, most women are concerned of the medical aspect. Oh, my God. What if something goes wrong in the delivery room? What if they have to do a C-section? So, wow, oh. I'm happy I'm in a hospital. At least that can be done. You know, we, we and let's interrupt you. I've had two daughters. And in both cases, we chose two different hospitals. And in both instances, Instances, they were born in the room that we were in so the delivery room was there and then immediately it turned into our room so the baby never left 
Fantastic. Um, we made that um, conscious choice because, you know, obviously my ex was a psychologist as well. But um, there are facilities here in Southern California for those that are listening here and other hospitals around that, hey, the birthing room ends up being the room where you're going to be in at least for, you know, a while while, you know, things calm down and you have your child. So I agree with you. But, you know, there are decisions and choices that can be made ahead of time as much as you try and, you know, be proactive. Unfortunately, when the, when the, when the event occurs, it's another story. Absolutely. And there, there isn't a place for the medical system. And no. that's not what we're talking about. What I'm talking about, too, is just saying, where is the mother's voice? Where is the mother who is having an input about what she requires and desires without having to fight for it, without having to defend or justify her instincts? That's what I'm talking about. When will we have a world in the birthing arena that actually says to a woman, what do you need? How can I help you? Mm -hmm. And I have a saying that I say in my work, women don't need to be saved. They need to be loved. That's it beautiful. is that simple. Women don't need to be saved. They need to be loved. And, and if we can create those environments where we truly absolutely. are hearing what a woman needs, really seeing her and acknowledging her without her needing to defend and justify that voice, that's when I think we're going to see change happen. And it's what Judy said. We have to encourage and inspire women to speak up for what they need. What is your instinct telling you? Let's start from the premise that everything could go right and we can work from that center rather than everything going wrong. Well, you have to understand, Maha, that um, MD, do you know what MD stands for here in the United States? Doctor. It's a doctor? M no, ma'am. It stands for medical deity. Okay, medical deity. <laughs> medical <laughs> deity. So, you know, they're the MD, so therefore right. they are the medical deity of the deal. So if you're just tuning in and joining us, you have tuned in to <laughs> Dr. Judy WTF, which is What the Freud, and I'm your host, Walt Lusk, here on the UBN Radio Network. We have Dr. Judy Rosenberg in studio, and all the way down under, which is tomorrow in the International Dateline, we've got Maha Al Musa, which is a breastfeeding advocate uh, to the max. She's also a belly dancer, which I want to hear more about. And she's the founder, back in the late 90s, of the Mindful <laughs> Movement to awaken birth wisdom and we are just getting quite a uh, wising up here and learning about medical deity and uh, of course the doctors have a practice and that means they just haven't gotten it right yet i find in my practice that women who are torn away from their babies because they have to go to work feel tremendous amount of guilt and shame and it hurts them it physically hurts them not to mention that the breast milk feel, fills up and then there's no release and there's no flow with nature, which is the, the coordination of the natural um, engorgement of the milk and then the release of the milk. And now they have to schedule it around their pumping time because they can only pump during lunchtime. And, 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 and so that, that the whole thing gets thrown off. And, mm -hmm. and, and, and essentially, I believe that women have to take their power back. And yes. they have to plan these things because if they don't plan these things, it will be foisted upon them, whether they like it or not. And so if you're a woman, you're pregnant or you're planning to be pregnant, if you have uh, um, um, uh, 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 options available to you, which I think people have options available to them, then go and research places where like Walt's um uh, hospital where they give the opportunity to have medical background with a birthing room and maybe even a water birth and then the emergency team is a backup plan but not as the primary plan and this is the, one of the reasons judy that i've been teaching mindful movement to awaken birth wisdom and mm -hmm. my my work is growing and growing on a worldwide scale i've now got you know teacher training in place because mm -hmm. Uh, my dream is to create sacred space for women to come to when they are pregnant, to come and tune into their body with their baby and start reconnecting to that living book within. It's about this time, is what isn't it? my work is about. Yeah, it really is about time. Uh, I want to hear a little bit more about the prenatal care that, uh, that you engage in with the belly dancing and preparing the body for movement. And really, um, I, I'm imagining part of it is just keeping fit so that by the time you're uh, birthing the baby, your body is in, in 
in, in tune with the motions of the contraction. So I'd like to hear a little bit more about the belly dance and how that fits into the um, the what you teach. Sure, sure. Well, the the mindful movement to birth uses the principles of belly dance birth. So it's the feminine, soft, gentle, earthy movements of belly dancing that we dance in the classes. So we use the circle movement, the figure eight, mm -hmm. the, sp uh, the spiral and the wave like movements. So basically, the movements are intuitive movements of birth. As I mentioned before, the mystical blueprint of birth is in, within every woman's womb. So in these classes, we get to access with our baby this living information or this organic information that is embodied within our wombs. And so it becomes a prenatal exercise mm -hmm. as well as movements to do during childbirth in that first stage of labor when the uterus contracts the body, the emotional, the physical, the spiritual yes. and energetic body needs to open. Mm -hmm. So these movements, as the uterus contracts, the body expands and you move into the rhythms of birth in a very mindful and conscious way. So uh, we also teach that whatever arises in birth, whatever comes up, whatever emotion, it's okay to be in whatever feeling comes up. So you move and dance into whatever's releasing in the body. So therefore, we learn to surrender to the, to the rhythms of birth, the waves of birth. There's no right or wrong. There's no judgment. It's not a performance for an audience out there. Mm -hmm. It's connecting you with your baby and the waves and rhythms of birth, regardless of what rises up. And so we also, create the classes. Yeah. Also an opportunity to heal the wounds. Yes. Our own childhood wounds through this process. Yes. And Absolutely. have those feelings come up of our detachment yes. and our traumas and soothe that within right. ourselves. And it's interesting how you mentioned the figure eight, which to me looks like a DNA strand and of course represents <sighs> infinity. And so yes. that we're tapping into the infinite symbolically and then the oceanic wave, which is also so the symbol of the the ocean and the movement and so how encoded you know I'm always fascinated with encoding how we are so intuitively encoded and so when we listen to this these natural um, patterns emerge that's right that's right so the symbols of life are within our own body mm -hmm. and so we are tapping into that memory because birth itself is ancient and timeless and these movements are ancient and timeless. These shapes, as you said, are symbols of nature. They are everywhere. The spirals in the galaxy, when we come to give birth, those movements we create to bring that baby down, to put mm -hmm. that baby in optimal position, are those spiraling and circular movements connected to the earth, upright, active, yep. using gravity. Yes. So it's it's beautiful and and it's interesting because when i teach and now i'm expanding further and further people have said this is the missing link in childbirth education mm -hmm. the actual movement and the the functional movement that actually mirrors what happens in labor so you are actually in a class participating in what will happen in labor as your body opens and expands. I remember and I remember when I was going through my pregnancies, they offered Lamaze techniques. And so the mm -hmm. entire class was uh, centered around pillows and where to place the pillows and the focal point and the breathing, the hee-hee breathing. But nobody really taught me how to move my body in conjunction to what I'm going to be feeling or what I was feeling. And you're, you're absolutely right. This is a missing uh, link. Where are you teaching next? Yeah, I was going to say, how is, it, how, is it, how is it being, being accepted where you are? I mean, is it, uh, I'm sure yeah, it's being I'm embraced traveling. and expanded. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was actually in America this year. I was in San Francisco. I spoke at the Birth Keepers Summit. Okay. I did a workshop in San Diego. I'm going to Japan next month. This will be my fourth year in Japan. I've taught over mm -hmm. 200 midwives in Japan. Wow. Then I'm going to New Zealand in November. And then I've been asked to come all over the world next year, back to America, to Europe. Mm -hmm. I've been asked to come everywhere, Brazil, uh, China, 
it's it's just logistics really a matter of me you know being able to get up and leave the three kids and they're, they're all growing up now so mm-hmm. you know I'm, I'm able now to see myself getting out there more and more and teaching and my work is very spiritually and heart oriented yes. so it's and I say in my classes the baby doesn't come out of your head mm-hmm. the baby comes out of your vagina out right. of your yoni get down to earth mm-hmm. yep Mm -hmm. connect with mother earth Mm -hmm. she will carry you she will support you and all the women who have come before you are holding you in this space as you birth never feel alone Mm -hmm. never feel alone it's like you and your baby collective female consciousness is what you're describing yes holding environment a female holding environment for this experience exactly and that's what's missing what what we're doing is we're creating awakened circles of awakened sisterhood circles of awakened sisterhood for birthing Mm -hmm. so women never feel alone they are supported speaking of healing human disconnect because this is what our byline of the the byline of the show right i'm i'm just putting together the last editing bits and cover of my book book. uh, called be the cause Mm -hmm. healing human disconnect and if we could start foundationally with how to parent how to mother even before that how to pre pre prepare the pre-birth experience so that we can then uh, be in sync with the birth experience and then expand to the community and have that community support and have the men in our lives support us and nurture us so that we can be the best nurturers uh, to our children and really respect the system and so it's beautiful that you're bringing it all back to intuition and nature, very primal. And we've come so far away from this. Do you have any CDs or books or uh, information yes. that people would you like to speak on that so people can sure. access you? Yes, I have a book that I wrote in 2007 and I released it when I was pregnant with Amina in 2008 mm-hmm. and it's called Dance of the Womb. So it has all the chapters of the dance that I teach, but each chapter is preempted with a story of my life. Mm-hmm. So the circle movement, for example, is tells the story of when I went back to Jordan at 21 after being taken as a baby. I returned to my Mm. homeland. Mm. And so then I talk about the circle movement and how that's connected to the journey of my life. So it's a beautiful, beautiful book. It's a world first book, an award winning book on belly dance for pregnancy and birth, Dance of the Womb. And then when I was pregnant with Amina, uh, 33 weeks pregnant, I actually made a DVD, which has also won awards. um, And that's also called The Womb. I have a distributor in the USA, birthadventure.com. And we're just about to launch the short version of my DVD, which is really exciting. So we'll have a long version that also has my home birth film on it. So you get to see me using the movements in the first stage of labor. Wow. So it makes sense. Yeah. yeah so, so you see it, me pregnant, going through all the movements, mm-hmm. and then you can watch me in labor at 46 doing the movements. It's <laughs> amazing. So Where can people access this book if they want to buy the book? Is it available on Amazon or how, how, could they, yes. how can they access? It's on Amazon and it's also on my website, okay. www.mahaalmusa.com. So well, you can buy it either way. Thank you so much because I know that the audience that tunes into our show uh, is already primed to listen for connection disconnection and they are interested in attachment theory and interested in the wounds that are are caused by detachment and this is the antidote and this is where we have to start it's it's the start right absolutely right i wanted to say one more too judy or another Mm -hmm. thing was sure um Another thing that happened to me in my third birth with my daughter at home Mm -hmm. with Amina was I had a bingo moment in the actual birth Hmm. and I call this self-generated healing and you'd be interested in this because what happened was because I was completely open and surrendered to whatever I was to receive from this gift of birthing, Mm -hmm. I had a moment when I was about seven or eight centimetres dilated where my body was so relaxed, I was in that altered state of consciousness, yes. which is the place we go, yeah, the deepest place where birth happens. Mm-hmm. It also happens in sexuality. You have an opportunity there. But deeply in the birth, I excavated deeply down into the cellular memory 
of my father's abuse of me. And it rose up in her birth. Wow. And it was incredible. It was incredible. Like, like incredible, incredible, like, like, like releasing incredible, that kind of incredible, not scary, incredible, not scary, not Not. scary, because I was in in an environment at home and Mm -hmm. I was supported by my midwife, my doula and my friend and my partner was there. Mm -hmm. I was able to completely relax in the birth. And it was unbeknown to me, I didn't realize this was going to happen. But what happened was it came like waves and I could feel the shift. I could feel an energetic and physical shift in my body. Those holdings where I had been contracted in my life started to open and release. And the memory of my father, the deepest memories that I had stuffed down because I was so afraid, Mm -hmm. came rising up. And I started to cry yeah. and cry yeah. and cry. It was incredible. And my whole labor stopped. It's just stopped. And I realized in that moment, I had that bingo moment where I realized birth is an opportunity for women to heal trauma, to create a passageway of clarity for the baby to come through. Wow. It was so clear. Mm-hmm. And I spoke about it at the Birth Keepers Conference in, um, the, in San Francisco this year was what my talk was about. And this is what I want to talk more about, how birth, when we give the woman the environment where she feels safe, secure and supported, as well as the baby, she has an opportunity to release trauma. Because what I hear is that we talk a lot about trauma in birth, mm-hmm. that we're, we're giving women trauma. But my experience was the opposite, opening the door to release trauma. And it was incredible. And I'm sure, I'm sure a lot of other ladies that were at that uh, convention probably uh, expressed similar experiences. There. Well, I'm going to be writing and yeah. speaking a lot more on this topic. And I really do invite us to continue communicating yeah. because I'd like to share this with my patients and maybe share it on my website, maybe do an article on, on this very topic of birthing as a an opportunity to release childhood trauma and repair and be that vulnerable where everything just, all the defenses uh, melt and open and then it's a rebirth not it's a birth not only for the baby but it's a rebirth for the for the woman as well so I'm really looking what are your, forward to keeping it what touch are your Facebook you. pages I mean what's your main Facebook because I know you're all over Facebook <laughs> uh, the page is Maha Al Musa spiritual birth visionary okay, okay. that's my main so page check that out unfortunately we have got to do our song mm-hmm. so we've been having the privilege of our international show of the Maha Al Musa, who is again the founder of the Mindful Movement to Awaken Birth Wisdom, and um, you can check her out and get her book, DVDs, and uh, everything else. And um, we are now going to shrink our tune, since that's part of what we do here at Dr. Judy WTF. And this tune is "Lady Madonna" by the Beatles. And so, I just want to say thank you so thank much you for being so much. the stand can, for women can, yeah, and the important absolutely. work that you are doing. And we will continue to be in touch with each other. And this is a profoundly important message that the human race needs to hear because we need to connect now and we need to start with mother-infant connection. So thank you very, very much thank you. for sharing and, with us. And uh, we admire your, you know, your professionalism and your passion. Thank you so much, Walt, mm-hmm. Judy. You're Lovely. welcome. Thanks. My God pleasure. bless. And here we are. Wow. So I got to mm-hmm. uh, do Lady Madonna. Well, I chose Lady Madonna because of the importance of having a father figure uh, next to the mother figure. Because Lady Madonna to me represents Madonna, single, right? Mm-hmm. Yes. I mean, alone. So um, go ahead. Lady Madonna, children at your feet, wonder how you manage to make ends meet. Who finds the money? When you pay the rent, do you think that money was heaven sent? Friday night arrives without a suitcase. Sunday morning creep in like a nun. Monday's child has learned to tie his bootlace. See how they run. So it sounds like this mother is really overwhelmed. There are a lot of children at her feet, and she's trying to make ends meet, paying the rent. And Friday night arrives arrives without a suitcase. It's just the sense of emptiness, and she's just really needing to, um, it sounds like she really needs to have support. So where is dad in the picture (laughs) Where is dad? Right. Lady Madonna, baby at your breast. 
Wonder how you manage to feed the rest. See how they run. Lady Madonna lying on the bed. Listen to the music playing in your head. So nobody's there. She's all alone. It seems like she's parenting all alone. Yes. And, and what we're finding more and more so is that mothers are parenting all alone and um, they're not being nourished. Tuesday afternoon is never ending. Wednesday morning papers didn't come. Thursday night, you're stoking uh, needed mending, stocking needed mending. See how they run. So there's this pattern of this everything busy, gets busy, more and busy. more overwhelming. Yeah. Nothing's done. Yeah. Never, you know, things are just not being mended. And um, and and imagine a mother who has all of this pressure on her. Yes. And she's trying to nurture her baby and other babies. And so, uh, what's left over for them when she has this much on her own shoulders? What's left for her? And the question is, how many children are we talking about here? Because right. it's more than one. Right. Lady Madonna, children at your feet. Wonder how you manage to make ends meet. So my choice for the song is obviously because we our guest was uh, a, a person who is passionate about breastfeeding and connecting. And um, my message to the fathers out there is that please nurture the nurturer and be there for her so that she can feel a sense of your support. And so the trickle down can then uh, trickle down to your, your child and children. And that is our show, folks. Uh, we are going to close out. This has been Dr. Judy WTF with our international show today. I'm your host, Walt Lusk. You can pull us on Stitcher and iTunes and watch us on um, YouTube. It'll be uploaded uh, soon. And appreciate all your letters and uh, requests for songs and shows on info at Dr. Judy WTF. So until next time, we're going to have another special guest.